Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight to um, celebrate the launch event uh, for the debut full length poetry collection uh, by Warson Shire, Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head. Um, this beautiful book right here that I hope you all have just gotten today or have already ordered through Booksmith. Um, my name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager for Booksmith, an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. We are in for a, a big treat tonight. Warson is in conversation with Tracy Clayton. Tracy Clayton is an award-winning podcaster, writer, and humorist from Louisville, Kentucky. She's the host of several podcasts, including Another Round, Netflix's Strong Black Legends, and Back Issue by Pineapple Street Media. She enjoys snacks, admires birds, and loves her mama. Um, and we're in for a treat. Um, Tracy, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, oh my gosh. Hi. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm so excited. Do I start now? Do I go? <laughs> All right. Um, and and, and the, the star of the evening, um, Warson Shire, is a Somali British writer and poet born in Nairobi and raised in London. She's written two chapbooks, Teaching My Mother How to Give Birth and Her Blue Body. Uh, she was awarded the inaugural Brunel International African Poetry Prize and served as the first Young Poet Laureate of London. She's the youngest member of the Royal Society of Literature and is included in the amazing Penguin Modern Poets series. Shire wrote the poetry for the Peabody award-winning visual album Lemonade and the Disney film Black is King in collaboration with Beyonce Knowles Carter. Uh, she also wrote the short film Brave Girl Rising, highlighting the voices and faces of Somali girls in Africa's largest refugee camp. Orson uh, Shire lives in Los Angeles with her husband and two children. Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head is her full-length debut poetry collection, and we're so honored to be hosting tonight. Orson, um, congratulations on this extraordinary book. And um, Tracy, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and leading the conversation. Of course, of course, it's an honor. Um, just to reiterate really quickly, if you have questions, when else are you going to get to ask them of the one and only Warson Shire. So definitely pop those questions in the chat. Um, uh, I have to start by saying also congratulations on your first official collection of poetry, which to me surprised me because I feel like your work has been a part of my life, internet life in particular, since like the Tumblr days. So I didn't even realize that this is like the first full collection and I'm so ecstatic for you. All of my friends want you to know that they are screaming at their computers right now. And <laughs> we're just thrilled. We're so happy for you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, I was telling you before how I feel about you, but I should say it here. I just think you've got such beautiful, lively, electric energy. And um, I think you're hilarious and you've got such a wonderful sense of humor. And I love your perspective. And I just really excited to be speaking to you. So thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't expect to cry this early in the evening. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, before we get into everything that is this wonderful, glorious book um, and you and your life, um, I know that the world is a lot right now for the people who are on the planet. <laughs> Animals too, honestly. The world's a lot for everyone. There's so many triggers left and right everywhere especially with what's going on the, in the Ukraine and with Russia and uh, just the anti-Blackness that's happening at the borders. Um, my first question to you is, how are you through all of this? Like, how are you holding up? How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Um, um, yeah, I'm good. Um, I often, whenever I'm going through anything difficult, I struggle with, um, like different mental health stuff like OCD and, and anxiety and stuff like that. So sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming, but whenever it does get difficult, and, and I know that some people say you shouldn't, but I, I always look to those that are going through much harder things in order to kind of gain perspective. And yeah, sometimes I, it might come across like I'm just kind of undermining what I'm going through, but I am so used to doing that, that, mm. um, um, it also allows me to be grateful. So, you know, um, whenever these horrible things are going on, it seems like they're constantly going on. Um, I can usually tell 
that something really atrocious has happened because I see a spike in people using like particular um, quotes. Mm. Um, but what's never lost on me is that it's rarely used for the people that I actually wrote it about, which is, and which are the darkest of the refugees. Um, you, it's really um, a strange position to be in where on one level, obviously you wanna be able to provide as much awareness for every single group of people that are suffering. But then you see my words kind of co-opted by um, more right-leaning people whenever the refugees look like them. And when it's not um, what my words are saying um, are just like a bleeding heart. But when, it, when the children that are suffering are blonde with blue eyes, suddenly the words have a lot of meaning. So it's mm -hmm. a strange position to be in when um, there is a hierarchy in suffering continuously and black people and the darkest of the black people are always at the bottom. Um, and seeing what's happening in Ukraine, it's so difficult because it's like, okay, so even when there's a war going on, uh, mm -hmm. you still have time for racism. Um, <laughs> and Amazing. well, it's just fascinating because um, human beings have always been like that. It's almost as if the desperation brings out, well, it is that the desperation brings out the worst of yourself, basically. So, well, you asked me how I was and I started talking about all I of that. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't ask that question unless I actually really, really mean it. Mm. And um, also, I just feel like nobody checks on Black girls, you know? Yeah. A thing that's playing in my mind right now is um, that time, I don't know if you saw this clip, it was a long time ago, when, um, oh dear, I'm forgetting uh, uh, the names, Harry and Megan. Megan, her name's Megan. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. I was like, I'm going to get kicked out of this room. <laughs> um, but I remember um, a clip of her talking to a news reporter and um, he was just like, how are you? And just looking at her face, she was like, thank you for asking. Nobody ever asks. Um, I try to make it a point to, uh, to do so, especially when the world is literally on fire. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Well, uh, let me take this opportunity to ask you how you are and how you've been holding up. Ooh, we only got an hour, so I don't know if we got enough time for my issues, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my honest answer is that today was okay and that it honestly changes every single day. Um, speaking of gratitude and gratefulness, I'm leaning on that a lot as I'm also like watching the news and just trying to remember that like there's so much bad, but there's still good as well. You know what I mean? Um, also having a therapist is not a bad, it's not a bad lot in life. So that's, that's really, really helping. Um, yeah. I'm okay today. I'm okay right now. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so let's get into this book. I have so many questions about so many things. Um, and when you mentioned that you can always tell sort of what's going on um, based on like the spiking of certain quotes in certain poems of yours. Mm -hmm. I assume that one of those is home, yeah. right? Yes. Um, that poem sounds me, um, like I, I don't know when I first heard it, but it first like hit me and like really, really touched me actually about a week ago. I was at a bar, I was writing and um, I was working on a piece about home. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, which is where Breonna Taylor was murdered, unfortunately. And just the way that that broke my connection, like my tether almost, I just feel like sort of, I don't know, it's it's a lot, it's complicated. And when I found that poem in that bar and I was, I was just like, oh, that's what this means. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd love to start there. Um, but I kind of want to start at the end of the poem, if that's okay. Um, the the version that's in the book um, has a a stanza, a part in it that I had never heard before, like in watching videos of you read the the piece, um, and I would love for you to read that part, the second okay. part. Okay, so starting oh the the last stanza, right? Yes. Okay. 
I don't know where I'm going. And where I came from is disappearing. I am unwelcome. My beauty is not beauty here. My body is burning with the shame of not belonging. My body is longing. I am the sin of memory and the absence of memory. I watch the news and my mouth becomes a sink full of blood. The lines, forms, people at desks, calling cards, immigration officers, the looks on the street, the cold settling deep into my bones, the English classes at night, the distance I am from home. Alhamdulillah. All of this is better than the scent of a woman completely on fire, a truckload of men who look like my father, pulling out my teeth and nails, all these men between my legs, a gun, a promise, a lie, his name, his flag, his language, his manhood in my mouth. Woo! Girl, I mean, the, the poem was already heavy, already a lot. Um, and then this one, I feel like it just, it does something to me physically to read these pages, read these words on the pages, and then to hear you read them. Um, I'm very curious when this stanza was added to the poem and also why. So, um, the, okay, so actually, well, thank you for asking me because this question, because I can also like clarify why there are so many different versions of the poem all over the place. And sometimes people have, have added their own little stanzas and edits to it as well, which is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> what? They're like, remix. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so I wrote, at first I wrote the, um, I wrote it as a free write when um, I, I I traveled to Italy and I think it was like 2004, well, actually 2011 or 2010. Um, I went to Italy and I met with um, African refugees um, that were living there and a lot of them were Somali and um, they were just talking about how when you're released from the concentration, um, when you're released from the refugee camps, um, um you're basically told you can go into the city but you're not given any money you're not given any papers you're kind of just like go meet you know just survive basically so what people usually do is they go out and they try to look for somebody that looks like them and then everybody kind of ended up sleeping at this old embassy that had no heating no running water and when I'd gotten there the night before a young man had actually jumped from the roof so I was listening to their stories and um I was I remember I was young and also my you know my parents are refugees as well so I'd always heard these kind of stories and experiences but seeing it firsthand from people who didn't have the opportunity to settle down or to start a new life were actually in the that in-between space that is so much like purgatory but leaning towards hell rather than anything else um um it was very 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 emotional so I wrote this free write right and then um I remember I had like a blog post um and I posted it on there I kind of used to just use it as like a diary entry um like I went from blog post to tumblr for a little bit um um so when I was working on my chapbook, teaching my mother how to give birth, I took that free write and then I turned it into a poem called Conversations About Home at the Deportation Center. And so that turned out to be more of a prose poem and not like the poem that people share a lot. Like it was edited because that first poem that people share a lot, I think also what they feel in it is probably a lot of the, because uh, it's a free write. So it's like all my emotions, like bleh, kind of thing. And then in the book, I was able to edit it and clean it up. And so in this collection, I decided to do a bit of both because people are very, I mean, there's an urgency, I think, to home in the, the free write. And um, I wanted to also bring in the, the, the storytelling aspect that's a little bit cleaner 
um, from conversations about home at the deportation center. So that second section is actually from that poem, conversations about home at the deportation center. So yeah, these poems, um, I think what's interesting about them is that you can keep playing with them over, like, especially if you're a perfectionist or quite hard on yourself. Um, yeah. it's really difficult to not leave it alone and keep playing around with it. But, and that's the thing about when it's in a chat book, you can always go back to it. But when it's now published in an actual collection, mm-hmm. you have to leave it alone. It, 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 that's how it looks. Mm. Um, I don't know if this question is something that I should know already, um, but what is the difference between a chat book and like an officially like published copy aside from the manner that it's published is that what it is yeah I I don't think you should know because to be honest I don't really even know but I think it has something to do with like prizes so okay um um chat books are much easier for you to but chat books are much slimmer they only you know sometimes it's like so they're easier for new writers and they're easier to get published I mean it's cheaper and um um, and usually it's quite inaccessible for, 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 for newer poets to be able to be given the opportunity to publish a first full collection. First full mm-hmm. collections are judged much harder than chat books. Chat books are kind of seen as, I don't know, I would kind of take it back to, you know, how like mixtapes versus your album, you know, like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Perfect um, illustration and get in there. Yeah. So full collection is kind of like, okay now I don't know it just feels that's why I took so long with it well I was not only working on that I was working on other stuff too but I felt full collection really represent like how well you can write to me anyway and so I didn't want to rush it um I really wanted to work on the craft and be proud of it um and with the chat books I feel like they're much more forgiving there are poems in there that don't even make sense to be seen right now <laughs> I was young and you know everything felt possible so uh-huh. I'm grateful for them yeah yeah um I'm just gonna keep on with my questions that maybe I should know the answer to train um uh, so I actually wanted to be a published poet when I was younger I fell in love with poetry like as soon as I could read um I've got so many just like just really bad poems, but I kept all of them, you know, because I was just like, they feel like my children or something. I don't know. Um, as I got older, I stopped writing poetry and I didn't understand why. I was like, I don't know. I just don't like it anymore. I just don't know. I don't get it. Um, and I think that, I think it's true that I, as I sit here, as someone who has written poems before, as somebody who loves to read poetry, how do you write a poem? Like, what's the process? Like, do you <laughs> do you sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna write a poem now? Or are you like, do you get the idea first? And you're like, now I'm gonna write the poem. How, what? <laughs> oh, no, like, honestly, you know, these questions that you're asking that you should know, I guess we should all know them, but nobody knows them. So thank you for asking them. But I remember the, I, when I first wrote a poem, I didn't know that was a poem. I didn't know what I was doing. It just, to be honest, I couldn't really tell the difference between at first like diary entries and poetry. It kind of felt like just a disjointed voice. Um, I think um, a poem is a poem if your intention is that you're writing a poem. It can look like anything. It can sound like anything. I think people find um, um, we're just all a little bit too hard on ourselves and try to make things really narrow. If you set out to write a poem, it's a poem, just like if you set out to write a song, I guess it's a song. Um, but then obviously we go into the more technical sides of like, you know, and that you know about because, you know, you studied and um, that's when form and structure and shape and 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 all of that comes into it but I think a poem is the intention and it's the just the spirit behind it before I used to think when I remember being really young and um a friend a teacher of mine seen some little scribbles that I was doing in my notebook when I was like 11 or 12 years old and she was like oh these are poems and I didn't think they were poems I thought they were like um like the stream of consciousness basically but what is the difference between the two I think when you go back and then you clean it up and you, um, with intention, 
like shape it into something and when you read more poetry then your ideas of what a poem can be is able to expand as well if that makes any sense I think um it's a poem man. if you think it's a poem it's a poem that's how I feel I think or I wonder if maybe that's what sort of scared me off because like the older I got the more um anxious I got like I have pretty bad anxiety and mm -hmm. having to make decisions is really really hard and I think that when writing a poem it's just there's too many options you know like it's just like I can do anything like really like I don't have to like I don't know maybe that's what overwhelms me about it but I do miss it this book made me realize that I do miss poetry I miss writing poetry and I never thought that I would say that because I was like I'm done with poetry forever um you know what I would I would love to do with you uh, at another time if you are interested is I would love to do like a guided free write with you where then like it's so 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 um I mean we actually last night I had the online workshop with such an amazing group of people and um uh, there, there's a few exercises that I would write and exercises that I would love to send you and I think that would really inspire you and get it going because it is like when you're just too much in your head listen if I mm -hmm. if I like I really love photography I actually really love a lot of different um art basically but I will never do it seriously or even tell yeah. like because I'm terrified <laughs> if I didn't start poetry when I like as young as I was I mm -hmm. would have completely talk myself out of it like completely mm -hmm. even right now I still feel like a complete imposter so mm -hmm. what is a poem and blah like ultimately I think you just have to kind of like make it happen for yourself especially people like us I mean it's really hard for us to take ourselves seriously yeah for, for the obvious yeah. reasons so mm -hmm. I remember when I first um people when I was around 18 or whatever and people would be like so what do you do and I would find every like I, I would cringe at the idea of saying I was a poet because I felt who like how can I say I'm a poet yeah. like what I makes you a poet uh -huh. yeah um and sometimes it still comes up so I think all of that is just um, bullshit basically mm. yeah, what do you so do when it comes up like even after all of this success when you hear that voice like are you just like offended? Like, how dare you? Like, <laughs> not see? <seen? laughs> Do you not know? Like, what is you? What is oh man, I I I have a real. I feel like most of the time I'm on autopilot. If I sit down and think like where, you know, I think about the little girl that I was. I think this is what this book means to me. Actually, it was trying to like bridge the gap between um, the young girl that I was and the adult that I am now. And I can't believe where I am and how I. I didn't think. I know it sounds like cliche, everybody says it, but I genuinely thought I had no future when I was younger. Like I couldn't imagine any of it. I didn't even think I'd be alive at this point, a bit dramatic or whatever, but I genuinely, it felt like nobody cared and nothing was ever gonna happen. And I know that so many people feel like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would like this book to make people feel like Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Doesn't matter what kind of family you come from, how much money you guys have. If your teachers hate you, if you're getting bullied at school, if you feel like you're ugly, if you've got eating disorder, if your hair fell out, it don't matter what's going on. Basically, it's going to be fine. Um, because if you don't get told that, you never have any hope. And I think a lot of us need that because there are some people in this world that are just born feeling like things are going to go well for them and it does and yeah. you know I think there's a lot of self fulfilling prophecy involved in that so poetry for me was always like I felt like it was you know people love to talk about manifesting or whatever I don't think what is more powerful in doing that than actually writing it down so I always did that and mm -hmm. growing up I really really struggled with self-esteem and I still do so now when I get those intrusive thoughts and like you were saying like listen I'm on medication I see a therapist I don't give a crap I don't have no shame about all of this I figured out how to deal with my stuff so I don't project it onto other people don't put it on my children don't put it on my partner like end up like I always thought that I was going to completely lose my mind at some point so I'm always doing everything like you know all the self-care stuff and everything to keep it 
um, to keep myself steady. And so poetry is a big, big, big part of why I am steady and why I didn't turn out, unfortunately, like a lot of people in my family and my community, there's a lot of like, um, you know, self-destructive um, responses to trauma, which makes complete sense. But I didn't want to get caught up in that because um, I was really, really stuck in it in my teenage years. So now when I get the thought or th like that little voice um, that says like, man, you're just like, you know, it's all hype. You can't even write anyway. And yeah. you're just kind of lucky and, you know, it's going to probably end soon and all of this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I just think, well, man, shut the fuck up. Like, what the hell? It's bullshit. I know it's bullshit. Yeah. And I just think of myself as a child and think how proud I would be of the fact that I have gotten this far and I haven't, I haven't killed anybody. I <laughs> haven't. Um, <laughs> this, I feel like we don't celebrate <laughs> that enough, you know? Like, if yeah, that yeah. just rolls up one day and we're like, you know what? I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. And it's done. Well, I always used to think about that when I was younger. Like, you know, <laughs> if everybody just had enough, it would be mm, treacherous out here. But Absolutely. um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I'm very curious to know how your um, writing changed once you were exposed to therapy and meds, because um, I know, like you said, like writing and poetry in particular is um, therapeutic in itself, in and of itself. So once you added other therapies to that initial therapy, how did your writing change? I think it got better in that um, it wasn't so... I think, so, you know, the romanticizing of dysfunctional relationships. I remember being young and like kind of going from one messed up relationship to another because it was inspiring, you know? That's every <laughs> idiot, every single idiot you meet was amused. So like, you're kind of like looking for that feeling. And like, I was like driving myself insane by constantly going from trash to trash, knowing that it was trash, but knowing that, some amazing stories are probably going to come out of there. I didn't want to go in that direction anymore. So once I figured out some stuff and got on medication. <laughs> shout out, shout out. <laughs> but no, but medication specifically, I got on right after I had my first kid, which was in 2019, because I developed postpartum. And um, I remember sitting with the, with, the, with my doctor and just being like, you know, I couldn't breastfeed properly. That's what I'm working on. Like the next book is about motherhood and hormones and female body and all of that. But I remember not being able to breastfeed and just feeling completely out of it um, in the hospital. And she was just like to me, I think you need to go on medication. Like, have you thought about it? And I always had this really, really, really massive stigma from family and um, culture community all of it what it means and seeing it as a form of weakness thinking what if I'm become too dependent on it but I took that within six weeks I could sleep properly I wasn't worried about whether I was going to accidentally like fall on my child and kill him I was worried about a lot of stuff that didn't make any sense because I developed agoraphobia it was a rough time for a mm. little bit just so um that really brightened up my world I mean I would Rec you know I recommend it to and obviously speak to your doctor and everything but don't be afraid of medication don't be yeah. afraid of that because you might have a chemical imbalance and that's the only way that you're going to be able to fix it so yeah. for me it made me um sleep better um which helped the work and then also therapy allowed me to be able to genuinely unpack what is going on so that when I'm writing about it I'm looking at it from another perspective not just feelings 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 but looking at it from um, like from a health standpoint so that I'm able to actually unpack unpack it and not just write about it and write about it because for a while especially because I, I write a lot about my mom it felt like I was writing about her but I wasn't getting to any kind of resolve until I went to therapy and then I wrote about her and I wrote about her with empathy and understanding and then forgiveness. And it was like, oh, okay. And now I, I just, the weight is gone. I just feel, and that's all it's about really, isn't it? So therapy, medication, write about it. That is the mm. way to recover from any kind of <laughs> Doctor's orders, write it down. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited to read you talking about motherhood because um, 
I myself um, do not have kids and I don't want any children because of my anxiety. Um, and also just like the thought of, I, I truly don't think I would survive the postpartum depression that would absolutely come, you know? Um, what, how did poetry help you during that phase in your life? Like, did you write about your fears about maybe hurting your kids and agoraphobia? Yeah, I write about every single thing, every, every single thing. And then I don't just write about it from my perspective. I do a deep dive into like the worst case scenarios of this situation. I mean, mm. but I'm um, so like, because there's like postpartum psychosis, which is like absolutely terrifying. And I'm so grateful, so thankful that I didn't get to experience that. I couldn't imagine the horror of that. Um, and, you know, I send my love to all women who are experiencing that and just extreme mental health issues in general. Um, I mean, because that's on another level that people then start talking about you like you're not there and, mm. and disrespecting you on another level and then it's mm. terrifying to be in the hospitals and stuff like that but so um yes m my thing was like if I was carrying a cup of tea and my kid's cot was there I would walk all the way around the whole entire room because I was worried that I was going to pour it on him by accident and it, then it just started getting more and more out of control with that um writing helps me with every single part every single thing it's the only reason why I do it the only reason why I found it um and it is a lifeline it is a lifeline and I really love the Alice Walker um quote she says um I mean it's not connected to the postpartum and stuff but it just in general with around like rage <laughs> she said <laughs> Just general rage. <laughs> Just general rage. She <laughs> said um, that writing saved her from the sin and inconvenience of uh, violence. And um, yeah, so for me, it really is something that just keeps me steady. I mean, honestly. And I have younger sisters who I raise, and I tell them all when they're really, really stressed out, just write about it, write about it. And even though they kind of feel like, oh my God, that's so cheesy. I don't want to do this and whatever. You're always talking about your feelings. Whenever they do it, they do feel better. So I recommend it to everybody. I mean, it feels, sounds so obvious. Yeah. And so cliche, yeah. but there's a reason why those things are cliche and human beings have been going to it forever. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just have so many questions and I'm just like, where do I go next? I, I, I just realized we haven't talked about a poem in a minute. <laughs> like maybe you need to reason I'm having fun. So I'm sure I'm having fun, then forget it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that this is one of the things that I love so much about your writing. Like you, you don't hold anything back and that's like, that's a looser version of what I mean to say. Like when you, you write about bad things so beautifully and your relationship or the way that you talk about bodies in your work and in this book in particular, since a lot of it is about girlhood and a lot of girlhood is about bodies and who owns your body and how you learn whose body it is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the When you talk about bodies, I feel like a lot of the language is very like, um, gritty like very mm. sharp like you speak um actually i would love it if you could read this part um i got too many stickies it's gonna take me a minute to which one it is i think it was one in the back um there's a poem where you might find it faster than i do where mm. you talk oh no nope, i found it um <laughs> no technician as a palm reader mm. um, I think this is a, a wonderful illustration of what I'm trying to say. Mm. Nail technician as palm reader. The nail technician pushes my cuticles back, turns my hand over, stretches skin on my palm and says, I see your daughters and their daughters. That night in a dream, the first girl emerges from a slit in my stomach. The scar heals into a tight smile. The person I love 
pulls the stitches out with their fingernails, black sutures curling on the side of the bath. I wake as a second girl crawls, head first, up my throat, a flower blossoming out of the hole in my face. This one took me on a, a ride because the your your imagery, of course, is is so good. So I can very clearly see the slit in the belly that has scarred into a tight smile, and just the the idea, the image of a child crawling up your throat and out of not even your mouth, but out of the hole in your face. Like it's very, you know. Um, I wish I had a better question than why do you think that is, but why do you think that is? You know, I think it's inspired by my love um, of horror. I really, really love horror. And so I think mm. I'm inspired by a lot of body horror. And um, the, that's probably how I've been able to deal with, you know, experiences with sexual violence um, and like childhood abuse, things that, um, I don't go into detail, but I think if you've experienced it, you can tell what I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think horror and um, kind of taking it to this kind of surreal, fantastical place helps me just deal with it. And I just like morbid stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like grossness. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. So wow. Um, but it's, I yeah. Saying that. yeah, it's like as I'm reading, I sort of envision like a very beautiful horror movie. I think so. I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Do you like horror? No, ma'am, not at all. Not <laughs> all my brethren feel the same way. My friends are like, what the hell kind of crap is this that you're watching? Uh, you know what's wild though? Like I, I don't like horror because I, I'm just like, I have enough to be scared of in my regular life. I don't need to be worried about boogeyman and stuff. But then I will watch hours upon hours upon hours of true crime, like stories <laughs> of people that actually exist on this planet that could just like actually kill me and not Slender Man. Like Slender Man's fine. I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. Um, but no horror it I just don't like the feeling of being scared I think mm. do you uh, not feel do you feel scared when you're watching the true crime stuff or are you looking at it from a way of like how you would survive that kind of situation yeah. yes yes I tried so hard to explain to my mother why I watch so much true crime and she just swore she didn't get it when first of all she's the one who bought me my first true crime book but that's not what it is but I was trying to explain to her, I was just like, I just feel like, I feel like I'm studying for a really big test that I might have to do one day. And that test yep. might be trying to outrun a serial killer. And I need to know, you know, like where other people like, it's it's all me trying to control the the anxiety and my fear yeah. of yeah. tons of things that I can't control. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that that's what drew me to poetry back when I was not so afraid of it. Um mm-hmm. And this reminds me of the opening poem, actually, Extreme mm. Girlhood. Yeah. Um, like the title alone, I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be a, a, a ride. <laughs> is girlhood not extreme enough, you know? Um, but I would love for you to read this piece. And I would love to talk about the extremeness of girlhood. Yeah. Extreme girlhood. A loop. A girl born to each family. Prelude to suffering. Bless the baby girl. Call of dissatisfaction. Patron saints of not good enough. Are you there, God? It's me, Watson. Maladaptive daydreaming, obsessive, dissociative. Born to a lullaby, lamenting melanin. Newborn's ears checked for the first signs of color. At first I was afraid. I was petrified. 
The child reads sorters each night to veil her from ill, protecting body and home from intruders. She wakes with a fright, someone cutting the rope, something creeping deep inside her. Are you there, God? It's me, the ugly one. Bless the type four child, scalp massaged with the milk of cruelty, cranium cursed, crushed between adult knees, drenched in pink lotion. Everything you did to me, I remember. Mama, I made it out of your home, alive, raised by the voices in my head. Ooh. First poem is right out of the box, swing it. <laughs> um, what, is, what is so extreme about girlhood? Those are two words that um, I was very, sort of stark and startling to see them together. Mm. I always, from a very young age, was just really, really, really pissed off with how boys and how differently boys and girls were were treated and went mm. as children, and I just felt like it was just so unfair. <laughs> which it, and I think specifically my community, I'm sure it's in lots of different, like across the board, um, it happens. But there was this really, really, like brainwashing to be done that you know, girls were going to be somebody's husband, were going to be some baby's mother, going to be in the kitchen forever. Um, so basically start training. And that's how I was raised. I mean, mm-hmm. the only reason, I mean, there's upside and a downside to it because the reason why I'm able to um, juggle everything right now is because I was like trained to be able to juggle it. But at the same time, that training breaks you and that training takes away from your joy and your self-esteem and how much you can envision the future. I remember very much so, I felt like the boys could go outside and the girls had to stay inside. But then outside of that, and now that's not to say that boys weren't in danger and that boys weren't going through their own, you know, horrors and difficulties, of course they were. And, you know, I have a younger brother and I saw a lot of that um, through his experiences. But speaking about it from the perspective of girls, I felt like you're born, they cut off your clit. Mm. And then afterwards, I mean, all over the world, it's literally dangerous to be born a girl. Mm. And because it's not happening possibly in our homes, we seem to forget that girls are buried alive. Girls are stoned to death. Girls are sold off as children. Girls are trafficked. I mean, this is happening right now in our communities as we speak in our neighborhoods and we overlook it i so amazing and so sad how often when i'm speaking to people comes up that as young girls that they were taken advantage of or they were abused or somebody came to the house or a friend of the family over and over and over again and then you grow a little bit older and now you have to be beautiful you have to look a certain way Um, you have to be desirable Um, there is just so much involved in it and it's really difficult and these girls grow up into women Um, and it's still really really difficult I wanted to call the whole book extreme girlhood but the only thing that stopped me from doing that is I passed I, I I told you know um there was a woman, this white lady, who um, I'm really fond of. <laughs> I told her the possible title name, and she said, "You mean like girls in the hood?" And I was like, "Oh, healthy enough." <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm not even going down that road. So... What a focus group! Wow. <laughs> but also, but also, yeah, it is hard for girls in the hood. It is, but yeah. at the same time, you know you know it's fucking hard so being a girl is really really difficult and I think being a black girl um and being um a black girl and nobody to protect you and 
it also feels like somehow everything is your fault and somehow you're supposed to also fix everything. It's terrifying. Um, and I, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. yeah. I feel like um I feel like this touches on um a que- which I'm sorry, I'm ignoring y'all's questions. I really really <laughs> I know I thought of, I'm being selfish, I'm sorry. Um, um but there's a question that says Tony Morrison says she writes for black people. Who do you write for? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, they ask you the this question about your poetics really on really early on like who do you write for and why do you write? And I would say that I write for people like me. And yeah, that could be um, black people. And, but it also could be, you know, anybody who's experiencing um, similar things in their life. But honestly, truth be told, I don't really think about who is going to read it whilst I'm writing it, but I know that I have a responsibility to my people mm. and my people are black people and I'm aware of how we're vilified and demonized and so a lot of my work is to um, add on to these beautiful writers um, that gave me pride and made me feel seen and, 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 and understood and representation is so 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 important so obviously I would be remiss to say that um, I don't write for black people but also to say that also kind of flattens the work also just to be like oh I only write for black people but the reality is that I'm deeply Afrocentric what I've been since I was a teenager I don't even know if people use that word anymore it sounds like cosmetic but you know (laughs) very neo soul (laughs) but yeah you know I think about you know, you can't, I find it fascinating when people say, I don't write with, but we, like my work is void of, you know, people that try to remove politics from their work. I think I am naturally uh, politicized. I mm-hmm. didn't have a choice in that. And so it's always going to come up in the work. And I don't want to say stuff like, oh, I'm not, a, 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 I'm just a writer. I'm not a black writer. I am a black writer. I'm a black woman. I mean, that's the way that you're seen. And, um, and also I'm really proud of that. Mm-hmm. but the work is for anybody that connects to it anybody that relates to it and but I would say a lot of the readers are women <laughs> that's one thing <laughs> yeah yeah okay. we have <laughs> that sense so of course we are <laughs> <laughs> um, um going back to um we were talking earlier about home and what is home and the sense of home and what happens mm-hmm. when home chases you out and when home is sort of a broken place someone asked what is your relationship to Africa slash Somalia now um my relationship to Africa and Somalia has always been kind of consistent which is though that's my root those are my roots um I have like a very nostalgic romanticized relationship with it where I because I didn't grow up there. I grew up in London. I was there since the age of one. I really do spend my time just kind of um, really taking in music, especially from the 70s across the whole of the continent. Um, I really enjoy looking into like Afro luxury, basically. I'm, I'm really interested in that and looking into how fashion back then, music. Uh, so my relationship to Africa and Somalia, is, that's my home you know <laughs> yeah I got to go there I, I, I visited Somalia for the first time um a few years ago and I was there for five days and it was the best five days of my life I got to swim in the ocean and it kind of just gave me back a part of myself um that you know so I think it was really important mm-hmm. and it's really lovely as well to be in a place where you know I feel that way when I go to South Africa when I've been to Kenya anytime I've been anywhere Jamaica anywhere where the, like even when I go to um I was at um, um like black neighborhoods in cities I mean I, you just feel back home it feels good because you're not you don't you know it's the polar opposite feeling of being in Sweden in the airport and nobody looks like you basically it's the absolute opposite of it <laughs> when you feel that all the time and then you go to to a country in Africa um, 
you just feel like, oh, damn. So that's what everybody else gets to feel every day. Just like it's normal. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I had that experience when I went to Ghana for a friend's wedding. And I just like, we were just out one day and I'm looking around, I'm just like, there's black people in all of these advertisements. <laughs> what? Yeah, <amazing. laughs> there was like, no white folks around. And it was, first it was culture shock. But then I was like, hey, you're going to be shocked by your own culture. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, come on, like, girl, get it together. Yeah. But um, <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. Um, speaking of places, let's go from Somalia to <laughs> this question. Is <laughs> me. Somebody just said, why Los Angeles? And in my head, they say it with an attitude. Like, why, why LA? Because I, I, I like LA. I do. We've had a tense relationship, but I find that like with my girlfriends, like black girls who either live out there now or they used to live out there. They're just like, it's a terrible place. Don't come out here unless like for your mental health, they're always like, you know, like being in the water and like the temperatures are great. Everybody's not all on top of each other, like New York. But um, I, I hear a lot of black women just be like, no, it's not, it's not really a place for us. They, they especially say, don't go there if you don't have a man. Like, you're not going to find a boo, if a, like a black girl boo out in LA. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel like, yeah. So why LA? Why LA? To be honest, I didn't choose to be here. Um, it was, okay, so I moved over from, like, I thought I was always going to spend my whole entire life in London. I mean, I love that city. I love everything about it it's home um but then I fell in love with someone and they lived in California um not in LA though it was mm -hmm. like in the Central Valley I'd never been there before so I, it was a long distance relationship um are we gonna make it work I thought I'm just gonna travel I'm just gonna move you know I'm gonna wow. so I moved um it was a little tiny small town called uh Merced Mm -hmm. um I'd never been there before but it was fascinating because I, like you I'm also interested in a lot of true crime a lot of serial killers were active around oh, there yeah. oh, many. I'm just like what's wrong with California <laughs> so it, it was amazing doing a little tour of all the places I really enjoyed huh? doing that so it was really inspiring to stay there for a year and then oh sorry I got married um and then my husband um got a job here and re relocated and that's basically it like um no other real reason I mean the second I don't I don't I'm very much at home uh, you know so the weather's lovely but the vibes are weird I would say it's got a lot to do with like <laughs> demonic energy going on over here over there. and a lot of like desperation to be famous which never works out well you know makes people do weird stuff yeah but I, I'm not here by choice but I don't want to cuss LA too much but to be honest I just like the weather and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Absolutely <laughs> understood. Um, yeah. I feel like this is a relevant question. And then we've got three minutes. No. Um, <laughs> someone says, um, it's a two-part question. I'm going to read one of the questions. <laughs> um, will you venture into other forms of writing, like fiction, screenwriting, any horror mm. making? I would love to. I would love to. I think it goes back to, I mean, I, the thing is, I'm, I'm always working on something new. Like, I really, really have been working on this collection of short stories, short stories for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, so um, I would love to write a horror film. I would love to write a play. I would love to write a novel. But the thing is, like, these things take time and you have to really perfect the craft I don't want to do no half ass stuff mm -hmm. so yeah. if I'm going to be doing that I need to go learn how to do it and I don't want to be um disrespectful to the actual craft of it but yeah I, I'm I'm fascinated with writing in general yeah yeah Aww. would you do would you would you write for screen me yeah um I don't know why I pointed to me like who was of it <laughs> like, <who's laughs> <the hell>? um <laughs> don't know I genuinely don't know I feel like the idea of screenwriting is somehow like bigger and more overwhelming than like writing a play or like a collection of essays which I'm working on right now um and it's just <laughs> congratulations um, thank you thank you my literary agent is so tired of me it's been years 
like girl I know I know it's coming um take your time take your time so I will I think that's the thing that I have learned from this conversation and from you publishing this book honestly um, <laughs> but I don't I don't know if screenwriting is my thing um I would love to dabble in stuff though I think maybe tv writing one day like I have just like a bunch of like weird shit and like sketches in my hand I'm just like <laughs> I wonder yeah. if other people would like these um but also you know what if it pays, I'll do it mm. <laughs> that <laughs> <feels>. <laughs> All right. yeah okay we're at the 10 minute mark I know I understand um but I would love to <laughs> if it's okay um close on uh, one of my favorite pieces in the book um okay. bless grace jones oh yes i love it i just feel like it's just a good note to, to wrap on i'm so glad I, that you chose the poems because yes it was so stressful I was like, <laughs> <laughs> all of them <laughs> the whole book right Yeah, Grace Jones has always just represented to me like beauty and grace and and power and mm. just sexiness and I love how she would put people in their place. I think I'm I want to be more and more like her. I'm a little bit more of a people pleaser. And so for me, she's my whenever I want to speak up, I channel Grace Jones. Mm, that's a good voice to have in your head. Less. <laughs> Grace Jones. Holy mother of those deemed intimidating, patron saint of the unapproachable, savior of those told to soften their expression. Our lady of uncomfortable silences, Dame Grace Jones, your daughters damn their insomnia, fan in their dreamless sleep. A legion of women flinching at touch, fortifying. Monarch of the last word, darling of the dark, arched brow. We bless you, queen of the cut eye. We lay our burdens at your feet, careful not to weigh you down. From you, we are learning to put ourselves first. Ah. <sighs> Thank you so much for reading, for chatting with me, for writing this book, and for putting yourself first in ways that made this happen. Oh, thank you so much, Tracy. Of course, of course. Um, let's do this dream of consciousness writing thing one day. Yes, please. Sounds terrifying, but I'll do it. I feel like maybe I'm ready. Maybe I'm ready. Yeah, I think you need to get back <laughs> into poetry. I think you need to be open. I can't believe I've been thinking about that. Like I've legit been like, maybe I should try to write a poem tonight. And then I was like, don't, don't set yourself up. You're gonna have a good night. Just enjoy it. <laughs> but maybe, I know. maybe one yeah. day. Hmm? Yeah, it was so lovely speaking with you. Thank you. It was funny, it was light, it was sweet. It was, I loved the, all the questions you asked. And it was lovely looking at your face as well. So thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I have two more pages of questions. If you ever get bored, just you know, <laughs> you want somebody all in your business, just let me know. <laughs> I feel like somebody off on that. Okay. Oh, I feel like hi, Evan. Interrupt for a second. Hi, hi. I just wanted to come in and thank you both. This has been so wonderful, and I'm so proud that we got to host you tonight, Warson. And we're so pleased to have this book in our hands. For those of us who are holding it, I know that that is true. I speak for you guys. I'm sorry because I can feel it. I can feel it in the chat, and the love is everywhere. Um, I hope you're feeling it too. And um, Tracy, thank you so much for for leading the conversation. This has really been delightful. And um, uh, you have tuned in. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, um, but um, stay tuned. Uh, I, I don't think this is the last time um, that you're going to hear from from Morrison. So um, uh, you know, uh, uh, follow her around and, and ask her questions at her next event or um, for her next. Uh, hopefully, we can we can host in person uh, for the next one, Morrison. Um, and uh, and Tracy, don't be a stranger, please. Um, uh, when 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 you're, yeah, send us a line. And and everybody, thank you, thank you for being here and and, and joining. And and um, if you don't have the book yet, um, get a copy. You can you can um, click through the link uh, just beneath the video. Uh, it says we're out of stock, but that's not true. Don't worry about that. 
Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, uh, if you uh, missed anything, you need the recording, yeah, email me at events at booksmith.com and, and I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, any final words from you two? Um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go on. Oh, I was just gonna, again, apologize to everybody in the chat. I really did get caught up and just did not. <laughs> I feel bad, I feel bad. Cause I was like, I'll moderate the Q and A, no problem. And then I got to like three questions. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> No, also, it's, okay. the book. it's so good. It's so good. There's no way you can answer all the questions. Sure. Um, and and, and um, my official uh, statement about that is that all of the answers that you need. Are... <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. In the book. Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> thank you so much, Evan. Thank you again, Tracy. Um, and thank you to everybody who's watching. Uh, hope you guys have a lovely evening. Thank you for being here with us. Um, Evan, thank you so much for hosting this. And Tracy, again, we'll continue conversation wow. inside. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Lovely. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye bye. bye.